Well, where do we go next, Mark? Oh, okay. So, um, that was that was good, uh, Johnny. And now I was I was I was paying so much attention, I've lost track for for, for where we were. So we were uh, talking about the vision the... vision versus second sight versus actual visitation, right? I think the thing to realize is to my mind, and I think to Bushman and to Greg Prince and to many other modern scholars, you know, you might call them apologists or neo-apologists, but I would call it people who are doing what I'm trying to do, which is to understand how to make this thing work. And they've come to the conclusion that the 1832 version of the first vision is likely more credible than the 1838 version. And I'm going to sound myself like a bit of an apologist, and I apologize for that. Yeah, there's a double meaning of that word. I'm going to divorce myself from the idea that that matters for a moment. They're two different stories, and they serve two distinct purposes. So when we look at the 1838 version, we see some very, very significant things that are in it that are not in the 1832 version. For example, the 1838 version is about which church is true. It condemns the creeds, says that they're an abomination. It says the professors of those creeds are all corrupt. It also says that they teach for doctrine the commandments of men, which is to quote scripture. But these are fighting words. These are things that are going to be offensive to people. So you have to ask yourself, self the question, what is this about? And why is this coming up in the 1838 version? So the 1838 version is not only a singularity, which places it as a physical visitation of a physical father and a physical son. It focuses attention on the condemnation of world religion, which if you're another religion, and I've sat in interfaith councils, this is patently offensive. To say, that some, to say to somebody that their creeds are all an abomination to God, that the professors of your religion, otherwise known as ministers, are all corrupt, is basically to say that we're not going to have a dialogue. So, why was this happening in 1838? And what was the context of why this thing was derived? Now, that's a rhetorical question, and while I may have an answer to it, Warren, Johnny, Sandra, what was going on in 1838? Well, they were having a crisis of leadership in 38, where you had the witnesses leaving the church, the Kirtland Bank failure, all sorts of problems where he has to reassert his authority and establish his claim as prophet of God. So I think that's when he comes up with this new account. If he had just stuck with the 1832 account, that wouldn't have been any more uh, upsetting to people than the other ministers of the day that claimed to have a vision experience. Well, well, actually, I think Joseph came up with the account in 35. He had pretty much perfected it when he wrote it into his journal in 1835. The conversation with, with uh, Robert Matthews is quite similar to what he was writing in 1838. I, I think he was anticipating, you know, the fact that he wanted to get his history out and he wanted to show that, that he had authority from God. It was also the same thing in 1832. He was, the church had split uh, into two, two factions, if you want to call it that, not, not opposing, but different because we had the church in Missouri and you had the church in, in Ohio and you had Edward Partridge down there and you had uh, others like Oliver Cowdery who were in, in certain ways challenging Smith's authority. And, and, uh, and so he wanted to write a history where he says, you know, all the marvelous things that happened to me, the, the uh, you know, I, I, I was chosen by God, um, you know, he, he bestowed the priesthood on me, all of these things, all these keys were given to me, all this stuff happened to me, and he wanted to write that down. But when he did it in 32, he really didn't think through the timeline, and, he, and, and, and I think that there are, you know, very big problems with the timeline that Joseph Smith uh, um, um, had to overcome in 1832, and that's why he abandoned it then. And and if he had developed, and if his theology had had developed to that point where he had come up with a new conception of God, what a great way to announce it to the world that it was, hey, it was this way all along from day one, 
this is what God and Jesus were like. Well, I don't know in 38 if he still had it that firmly in his mind that the vision was to prove God's physicality. Exactly. I think, I, um, Johnny, I really appreciate that you're bringing up the 1835, but at the same time in 1835, that was the same year as the lectures on faith. Yes, now God is two persons, uh, but in a Trinitarian or Binitarian sense, and the Binitarian being that God the Father is a spiritual personage and the Son is a personage of tabernacle. Those are two beings. And he can write now, I mean, it, I, in, a, in a spiritual vision, one could see a spiritual God and a, you know, the spirit of Jesus Christ. I mean, the one could see that in vision. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, and of course, the 1838 version is not necessarily physical, though we make it such. But I, I appreciate the fact that you pointed out that in 1832 and 1835 and 1838, there was an increasing need to assert authority. And it really is about authority to be able to say, okay, if you accept the first vision as a singularity, then the authority of God is only through this person who has received this singularity and his successors. Whereas... Yeah. Go ahead, Johnny. Well, in the 1835 account, you have to read it. Uh, the, I mean, he says, a personage appeared in the midst of this pillar of flame, which was spread all around and yet nothing consumed. Another personage soon appeared like unto the first. He said unto me, thy sins are forgiven thee. He testified also to me that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I saw many angels in this vision. I was about 14 years old when yeah. I had the first communication. All the elements of the 1838 account are there. And, Plus and, some stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so I think that he had developed this um, before 1838. I don't think, I, I think I'm with, uh, you know, I mean, we could argue it, but I don't, I, yeah. I think I'm with, uh, with Sandra on the lack of physicality. I see physicality, uh, you know, eight, uh, section 130 and 131 of the Doctrine and Covenants being very, very clear about the physicality of God being quite distinct from the lectures on faith. They're, they're two completely different versions. So somewhere along the line, he developed physicality, but I don't see it in 1835 because lectures on faith is 1835. Make sense? Yeah. Well, and the 35 account that he gives uh, are not presented as a father and son because he sees many vision, uh, many angels in this vision. And the one, second being that shows up testifies that Jesus is the Christ, so that can't be Jesus. It's a second person saying uh, that Jesus is the Christ. So he has two beings, but they are not the Father and Son. Right. Let's, let's, let's change the topic because we're going to come back into um, how the apologists play into this a little bit because, because there's something significant that I see in 1838 going on that um, particularly affects the first vision account and affects how it's used in the church today. So I was saying that this is a polemic. It's a it's fighting words. It's something that is used to tell somebody that they're wrong. And it's, it's certainly there. And if that's evolving during the process, I think that's important to see. But the 1832 account has none of that polemic sense to it. It doesn't it doesn't it, it talks about how the whole world lieth under sin. Granted. Your sins are forgiven. Great. That's part of an epiphany. And, you know, during that period of time, um, you know, Oliver Cowdery, the witnesses, Whitmers, Thomas B. March, all the witnesses except the family of Joseph Smith in the 1838 time frame, they're all being pushed out of the church. They're the dissenters. And an interesting ha thing happens in 1838. Joseph Smith, as, as Sandra mentioned, has now left uh, Kirtland in the midst of the Kirtland Bank fiasco and scandal. And he's coming with Sidney Rigdon separately, and they eventually merge together, and they come into uh, Missouri. The Missouri Saints had uh, established peace in the land with the Missourians by staying in their one county. Well, with the uh, with the migration of the uh, Mormons from Kirtland now into a, into uh, Missouri, they needed more Lebensraum. They needed more room to grow, and so what they did is they started getting aggressive. And they said, no, we're not going to we're not going to just live the way we, you know, in this one county. We need to spread out. And so they caused some real dissension. And the and they also demanded that the people that were living there 
share all their property and everything with these people that had come from Kirtland. In fact, they were essentially suggesting Joseph and Sydney the same kind of economic model, the uh, Zion model, the United Order model, to to turn over all their goods and everything to Joseph and Sydney. And basically, most of the Missouri Saints would have nothing to do with it. They 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 didn't like that assertion of authority. They wanted to see common consent. They wanted to see something a little bit more uh, more democratic in the process. So what happens is there's a real division in the church. At the same time, yeah, Warren, do you have a no, he keep going. Yeah, yeah. So at the same time, there, um, uh, there's a group formed of vigilantes called the Danites. And this is organized under Samson Avar to include Harry Smith. And they did everything they could do to defend the prophet. And in July of uh, 1838, Sidney Rigdon gets up and gives two discourses that essentially threaten the lives of all the original believers in the church. And this Danite organization, vigilantes, volunteers, defenders of the faith, did everything they could to defend the faith from these dissenters. Now, of course, they went out and threatened assassination. They stole property. They burned the city of Gallatin. They did a lot of really nasty stuff. But this was the context of 1838 upon which this vision, this new vision is emerging as being fighting words. And the defenders are on the side of this, defending these fighting words. If you see where I'm going with this, that's how I see the rhetoric today as emerging. The 1838 version essentially is repeating the Missouri experience, not in killing people, not in taking their property, not in burning uh, cities, but in pushing out dissenters and making it very clear it's all or nothing. It's either our way or the highway. It's either all true or all fraud. And this is this is where I see this 1838 vision and the way that it's treated by the church and by the apologists as being very, very harmful to those of us who see things in, in, in a very different light. Warren, did you have something that you wanted to share on that? No, uh, uh, you, you basically said it well, and I would agree with you. It seems like uh, Clearly not in a physical sense today, but in a very uh, real sense, spiritual and, and community sense, uh, the same things happen today. I mean, I'm one of those that, that have felt like I've been pushed out of the church because I'm, you know, I'm not a rock solid, uh, true believer. And uh, I, you know, and if, if that's what the church aims is, I think they're doing a pretty good job of it. Well, to add on to what, what uh, uh, Mark said there, What's interesting is that when when Sidney Rigdon and and Joseph Smith got to uh, Nauvoo, the first uh, or got out of Missouri, the first thing they started, and this was April 27th, 1838, was a history of the church. And they wrote the very first part of the history that we have now, uh, up until about the the restoration of the priesthood that they claimed uh, or their baptisms by John the Baptist. That area is where they left off. And, and uh, for some reason, uh, they didn't continue. And Joseph hired James Mulholland to continue the work. And he started, he started writing in 1839. And this is, uh, we don't have the draft that Joseph and Sidney did. It, it, it's gone or it's still in, in a vault somewhere. Um, but we do have what they call draft one, which was Mulholland's draft, which picks up at the baptisms uh, uh, of Joseph and, and Oliver uh, in the Susquehanna River, all of that stuff. And from there on. And then um, Mulholland wrote another uh, a version, uh, which is the version that we basically have today. But in the meantime, and this is what is really interesting, I guess Joseph read that. And, and felt for a time that it was uh, a pulmic, like, like Mark says. And so he went and got Howard Corey to help him write another draft and to take all of that stuff and rewrite it all. And what, he, he, what Corey was doing was he would take like the word mob and, and uh, you know, they would call people mobbers and he, erased those kinds of words and those kinds of, uh, of, of things in it. He toned it down a lot. And then uh, he, he puts Nephi in there. And, and uh, 
and, 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 and Corey claims that Joseph came to him, said he wanted him to do this work. And then uh, Joseph then decides not to go with it and they abandon it. And Corey had made two manuscripts. These were uh, uh, kept by the church and they were locked up until 2005. We had no, you know, nobody saw them until the Joseph Smith papers published them. But what's interesting is, 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 uh, is that um, here's what, what, what he says. Uh, I was then requested by Brother Joseph to undertake in connection with Edward D. Woolley, the compilation of the church history. This I felt a decline as writing books was something in which I had no experience. But Brother Joseph insisted on my undertaking it, saying, if I would do so, I would prove a blessing to me as long as I should live. His persuasive arguments prevailed, and accordingly, in a short time, Brother Woolley and myself were busily engaged in compiling the church history. But Joseph abandons it and, 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 uh, and, and goes back to the history that, that Mulholland had, had compiled, and that was uh, picked up by uh, another scribe after he died. And so that's the one that we have now, which is uh, the one filled with, you know, uh, uh, well, how did you put it, Mark? Fighting words. The one filled with polemic, he said. Yeah, polemic. Fighting words. <laughs> the, the simple term is fighting words. You know, so, I mean. So what you're basically giving us, Mark Kriego, is a, is a motive for the changes in the 38 version over the 32 version. It wasn't just, oh, he's just remembering different details. It's that his theology has evolved. There's a crisis in the church. He's got to try and pull the ranks together. He's got to solidify his power. It's do or die. And the changes that we see in 38 are a direct result of that context. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm hypothesizing. And, you know, obviously it's something that, you know, is, is, is an opinion. Um, it, the, the evidence of history often is written by, you know, an agenda. And in, in this case, the, the changing narrative have significant differences between them. And that's what, you know, the apologists are tr trying to say, well, there's, and the, the church essay is saying there's no differences. And I'm finding in the differences something significant, something to be learned from those differences. There are two narratives, and these narratives serve two different purposes. And What's really strange is that in the Corey manuscript, Joseph's age is 15. In yeah. In the Mulholland manuscript, it's 14, and and in the 32 account, it's 16. So it's like the ages were all over the place. Not and, sure that's significant, though. Yes. Well, this it? leads me to to something that I wanted to bring up that Peterson brought brought up that and and and, and Prothero brought up was that this is all about memory and that and that it, it shouldn't be surprising to see all of these contradictions or all of these, uh, uh, you know, confused dates and everything. But what did Joseph claim about memory that, that I think you have to take either one side or the other. You can take, make a secular argument or you can argue that Joseph was a prophet and that he had the power of God and the priesthood. Joseph taught, uh, let me see here. This is 1839. He said, there are certain characters that walk with God, saw him conversed about heaven, etc. But the comforter that I will send shall teach you all things who he that loveth me, etc. This shall bring all things to remembrance whatsoever things I have said unto you. He shall teach you until you come unto me and my father. So we have Joseph saying that the Holy Ghost can help bring all the things uh, that I have said to you. And if you have a visit from God, then you, you know, you would know everything about it because the Holy Ghost would help you to remember. So either Joseph was a prophet and could uh, tap into this, or he was just a man and, like everybody else and, and had a faulty memory. But aren't you making, aren't you making an all or nothing uh, argument there? I mean, aren't you, you creating the same type of splitting that we accuse the church of doing is to say that um, just because he couldn't get the year right or in the various versions of it, then he must not have been a prophet because a prophet would get it all right. I don't think that's how it works. No, I, I'm, I'm saying the contradictions. There wouldn't be contradictions. The story would be the same because he would have, if you look, for example, um, if you look, 
they talk about the story of Paul. But if you look at, at, at the New Testament, the basic story is the same. In every verse, there's three versions in the New Testament. And he says that he saw Jesus. He says uh, he saw a person and, and this person goes, who are you persecuting? And, and he says, it's me, Jesus. And that's basically his story. Uh, and, and, and they're all the same except for the last one where he adds a few things. But the thing is, is that, is that, is that there's too many contradictions in these stories. Everything changes. Would, would. Well, again, I, I don't want to be accused of being the apologist, but the, but the reality is, is we, if I look at the, the four gospels, Matthew writes pre prevailingly from a Jewish Christian pers perspective. Mark is the earliest gospel and it's kind of uh, the saying source. And uh, Luke is, uh, you know, the Mark companion who's, who's writing it from, you know, from Paul's perspective. And John is coming from a very distinct perspective of a, of a post, uh, you know, a post overthrow of Jerusalem community that has lost its way and is, is reasserting a, a mystical kind of interpretation of things. They're telling the, the accounts of uh, Jesus Christ, of course, they aren't for none of them are firsthand, but they all have a specific agenda. There's a well, different of, of purpose course, for those narratives. But this is the thing. This is the thing is that, of course, we know that that's how memory works. But this is not what Joseph was teaching. He was teaching that he had the Holy Ghost that was his right hand man. I, I don't know how many times he said it in, in, in sermon after sermon. That, yeah, and he cha and he changed the revelations, and he changed the Book of Mormon I mean, many would, times. So he would be giving a uh, uh, a speech, and he would he would start translating uh, and say, "I'm going to translate this from the German," and he would and he would in the middle of that go, "Well, the Germans had it the closest, but the Holy Ghost tells me this," and then he would go off and explain something that had nothing to do with uh, the translation itself, and say, "This is how it's supposed to be because the Holy Ghost told me so." Yeah, so, and he could and he could translate a uh, an Egyptian uh, funerary document and make it the Book of Abraham or the Book of Mormon by the gift of the, the Holy Ghost gave him all of that. And, and this is what I'm saying is that in in the case of 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 these accounts of the first vision, um, no one seems to to uh, want to step up and say Joseph was claiming to be a prophet here. So why doesn't he use his prophetic gift? That's that's my point. I would like to jump in here that first off, when you mention the different uh, gospels, they all agree and are saying that Jesus died on the cross and resurrected. Uh, there's differences in the storyline, but they all have that seminal event as being the same. Uh, as well, it, far might have, it might have been added to Mark. Uh, Sandra, so. Oh, well, yeah, if you take the, don't go with the long ending, right, you're right. right. But the others all have the uh, resurrection. Uh, I, if I describe an accident and I say at one point there was only uh, one car in the intersection and he ran into a tree and the next time I tell it, well, there were two cars and they hit each other. And the next time I tell it, there's three different cars. You would say there's a problem with my story. But if you have three different people standing on three different corners tell the story, you would expect to see some differences in how they would relate it. But you don't expect the one person to come up with a totally different narrative each time he tells it. So I, And I think, uh, just to interrupt, I'm sorry, Sandra. This is really important. Um, here is how Joseph worked. And this is from Howard Corey, the one that, one, the one that, that, that wrote the, uh, the history that was abandoned. This is what he said. One morning, I went as usual into the office to go to work. I found Joseph sitting on one side of a table and Robert B. Thompson on the other side. And the understanding I got was that they were examining or hunting in the manuscript of the new translation of the Bible for something on priesthood, which Joseph wished to present or to have read to the people the next conference. Well, they could not find what they wanted. And Joseph said to Thompson, put the manuscript to one side and take some paper and I will tell you what to write. Brother Thompson took some foolscap paper that was at his elbow and made himself ready for the business. I was seated probably six to eight feet on Joseph's left side so that I could look at almost squarely in the left eye. I mean, the side of his eye. Well, the spirit of God descended upon him and a measure of it upon me in so much that I could fully realize that God or the Holy Ghost was talking through him. I never, neither before or since, 
have felt as I did on that occasion. I felt so small and humble I could have freely kissed his feet. Now, this tells you how Joseph did things. You know, if he couldn't find it in a manuscript or or he, he would just have a revelation. So if if he if he's not really having revelations and he's just making this story up, as Daniel Peterson says everybody's saying, then that's how you get discrepancies in your accounts because Joseph just gets impatient, says, you know, put that aside. I'll dictate it. This is what I want to dictate. And he just goes off. Got it. Well, Mark, since we're kind of uh, circling towards, you know, some, some final closing thoughts, can you take us through just some of the other main points that you've outlined that you think are really essential to this discussion so that people get a good overview of what's going on? No, I think we've covered most everything. I think the 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 real thing that we should I mean, I, we're kind of doing that, and that is, so for each of us, the implications of the two first vision accounts and what the first vision means is very different. So you know, Johnny's uh, pointing out that um, you know it's it, it's a credibility issue. I I see it as in part a credibility issue, but I also see it as being distinctive narratives. For different purposes, um, and 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 in, and I'd like to hear what Warren ha and and has to say about it, and and Sandra has begun to say about it. So why don't we go through first with Warren, if I'm putting you on the spot a little bit? Um, you know, what is the what does this discussion lead us with? What 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 do we go away with when we're thinking about the first vision? How do these differences affect you, and what? what do you do to to make it work or or how does it affect you um hard questions um it's not just the first vision but so much in the church history is so messy that it's it's hard to to try to make it all work um i i remember when i was a, a teenager i think it was a Sunday school teacher said well you know we weren't there in, in the in the grove of trees with Joseph during the first vision, so we really can't know what took place there. The only way you can find that is if you go and ask God and get a testimony of that. Well, I've been trying to do that for my entire life, both on the first vision, the Book of Mormon, other things about the church, and I cannot honestly say that I've had a spiritual witness that those things took place. So. For me, the, the historical truth claims maybe aren't as important to me as, as other people, um, because that's not what kept me in the church. But um, what I would like for the church to do is, for, for my church, is, is to rely less on its truth claims and more on its goodness claims. And what I mean by that is I want my church I'd like my church to be both true and good. I'm not sure I can say that it is true or that it's even good right now. And so for me, the, the only hope I see is if the church um, sort of takes the, the position of Elder Oaks in connection with, uh, with pre, uh, priesthood and apologies and so on, although I do think they should make some apologies for certain things. But I would like the church to come out and say, yeah, our history is messy. Uh, and some things we can't really know for sure, but by golly, this is a great institution and we're going to help you to be better people. And that's the only church that I can continue to support. And right now I'm not sure they're doing that. So for me, it is tough to, to try to navigate this. I, I would like more emphasis to be on, okay, what do you have faith in? Not necessarily what you have a knowledge of, but referring to the temple recommend questions. Uh, you know, I, I want to believe, I, I, I want that this church to be good, but right now I think it's it's a real struggle. And, and the more the church tries to just blow us all off, the the, the more people like me are, are just going to say, I give up and, and walk away. So Warren, you've got your stake president trying to support, you know, private evening discussions. You've got the church uh, selling Rough Stone Rolling in Deseret Book. You've got the First Vision essay, along with all the other gospel topics essays. You've even got general authorities now, apostles, saying in general conference that church leaders are imperfect, 
that the church church leaders make mistakes. Um, how is that not enough for you? Well, from a from a personal standpoint, it hasn't worked that way, as I referred to early and without going into all the details, because I didn't follow the line, so to speak. I was released as gospel doctrine teacher. I was told that I couldn't uh, hold the temple recommend because I can't say that, you know, I know A, B, C and D. Uh, and so a person like me feels like they're not really a member in full faith and, and fellowship, if, if that's the right term. Uh, and so, you know, we're sort of standing on the sidelines looking in. I appreciate what, what President Goffertson's trying to do, because that's exactly what he's trying to do, is, is expand the tent so people of various views, various uh, persuasions, whatever, can all be as part of this organization and learn from each other and, and move ahead. And so I, there's little pockets of that, but I think when it comes right down to it, most individual members who are in a situation similar to me don't feel that way. Got it. Okay. Um, Sandra, do you want to tell us what it all means for you? It all says to me that the whole system of Mormonism is man-made, that Joseph Smith was raised in a family divided over religion, and he tried to find a personal solution for the family by coming up with his own religion, which he did get his family involved in. But to... Uh, accept Mormonism is to accept his books of scripture, which clearly are his invention. Whether you say he did it on good intentions, um, they were still presented to the world as historic documents, as actual real-time events, which they don't match up to. The theology changes through his scriptures through the years. It's all... Uh, so nebulous, I see nothing there to embrace it. Why not just stay standard Christian? Joseph Smith says he was trying to figure out which church to join. He didn't give us a good answer. He came up with a changing, evolving church that did a lot of harm, not just good. It did a lot of harm, and it continues to do harm. I can't endorse Joseph Smith as a good man, I see him as a very manipulative, dishonest man. He might have been nice to people around him. I'm sure there were days when he was very nice to Emma, but he also put Emma through some terrible heartaches, claiming that God told him to take these different women and breaking his wife's heart. I hardly can see that as a work of God. So uh, obviously I walked away from Mormonism and had to take my stand with my family that I couldn't embrace it anymore. I was fortunate that many of my family still talked to me. Um, others have had <laughs> more troublesome uh, experiences with their family, but it just doesn't work. It's too much change, too much invention uh, for me to give it any credibility. Sandra, we talk about this a little bit more in depth in my interview with you, but I had Bart Ehrman on uh, Mormon Stories podcast recently. Mm -hmm. We've been looking at uh, historical criticism of the Bible. Why, you know, something, Bart Ehrman basically has written several books about how the Bible contradicts itself. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't necessarily even written by the people whose names bear the book, that those books contradict each other, that they've changed over time. And you, you only have to look to something as simple as, you know, in one version of, of the New Testament, Peter uh, dying by hanging himself. And then in another version, <coughs> Peter, um, you know, falling along in oh, a field, you mean Judas. right? Ju sorry, Judas, <laughs> Judas hanging himself, Judas running along in a field, falling down and his bowels gushing out. The, the sign above the cross is different. What, what's written on it is different in all four versions. And then Bart Ehrman would say that in the four gospels, you actually have significant contradictions. Why doesn't this same logic for you, um, you know, uh, invalidate the Bible? Are you giving Joseph a double standard with the first vision that you're not willing to apply to the Bible? He makes, Joseph Smith makes specific claims for his position that the Bible is not claiming. No one said that there can't be two different accounts of uh, what was written above the cross. I don't think the Bible makes that kind of demand of 
every single word agreeing with between one guy and the next guy. Joseph is the one that's making it out like God's telling him every step of the way. But I think the historical context of the New Testament does show a reliability of the text. And uh, yes, you have different views from the different authors. But I'm not saying Joseph isn't true because there are different tellings of the story. It's because the whole story contradicts itself. It, it's of a level and nature beyond anything that we see of the problem for the New Testament. Got it. Okay. Well, if you want to hear more from Sandra Tanner <laughs> about how she can possibly do what many post-Mormons can't do, which is reject Joseph, but uh, embrace the Bible and uh, the New Testament and Jesus, check out Sandra Tanner's amazing interview on Mormon Stories Podcast. Okay. <laughs> um, Johnny, how about you? What is this whole first vision story then in summary, in detail, sort of mean for you and, and Mormonism, the LDS Church, Joseph Smith, his credibility, etc.? I'd like to make a comment about what, what Sandra was getting at. And, and I think that the the problem that I see between the w what we have as the Bible and what we have uh, uh, at, uh, from Joseph Smith is that, number one, we don't have the original documents from the Bible. We don't have the original manuscripts. I mean, the first uh, fragments of, of the Gospel of John, I think, are the oldest. And, and, and those are like dated around, you know, 80 or 90 A.D., uh, we, we don't, we don't, and they're fragments. We don't know exactly if those uh, accounts were copied correctly. But with Joseph Smith, we have the original documents and we saw how his, he, we saw his methodology and how he crafted things. And, and, and that brings me to the first vision. It, it's like, um, I can't, get my wrap my mind around the fact that joseph smith had this vision the reason why is that the timeline i got i got to come back to the evidence and the timeline now when i left mormonism i was i i, I joined it at a very young age i was i was a, a pre-teenager and 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 i went to seminary and i went to church and i went on a mission and i came back i went to byu you know i i i did a, all of my due diligence with it. But when I, when I started getting into the history of the church, I, I ran across Adam God and that was a great stumbling block to me. And eventually it drove me out of the church, but you know, and, and then I was, had nothing to do with it for like 25 years. And then some Mormon missionaries knocked on my door around 2008 and they got me interested. We had a lot of discussions with them and I got interested in the history of the church again. You know, I was like, well, and, and I found a lot, when I went online, I found there were so many things that weren't available when I was a member back, you know, 30 years before that were out there. And it was like this flood of information was out there. And I just started reading and reading and I got really interested in doing research and, 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 uh, and, and writing. But to come back to the first vision, it's like... Um, all of the elements of it are from 1824. OK, he, he, he completes everything with 1824. I don't understand how he could do that. Even in the 1832 account, he says uh, after he has the vision, um, my soul was filled with love for many days and I could rejoice with great joy. And the Lord was with me, but could find none that would believe the heavenly vision. Nevertheless, I pondered these things in my heart. Then he has a line that he starts, which says, about that time, my mother end, and then that's crossed out. And the Joseph Smith papers claim that this canceled fragment may refer to the Presbyterian affiliation of Joseph Smith's mother and three of his siblings. In 1838, Joseph Smith recounted that they were proselytized to the Presbyterian faith. This, Joseph Smith in 1832 says that this happened right after the first vision. But we know that they were proselytized in 1824 uh, after the death of Alvin. So even in 1832, he's giving us clues that this doesn't add up. And so, you know, I, 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 I can't wrap my mind around the fact that this isn't just what I would call pseudepigrapha. It, it, it's simply Joseph writing uh, something religious 
that he could uh, give to his followers that many did in the early church, in the early Catholic church, and in, 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 in that period of time, there were many books that came out, the Nagamati texts, all of those pseudepigraphal books that people who were pious uh, felt that the, the need that they had to write as, as, uh, as Mary Magdalene or someone else, uh, Joseph Smith is producing pseudepigrapha here. And, 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 you know, whatever his motivations were, whether you want to believe he was a fraud, whether you want to believe that he was a pious fraud, or whether you believe that he was a prophet and did everything according to God, I can only look at the evidence and it just doesn't add up to me. So that's my opinion. All right. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Sandra. Now, Mark, uh, I, I really do want to spend a little bit of time with you. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, you are constructively engaging Mormonism, attending. Um, I think you have you said at the beginning you have faith in some of the aspects of Mormonism. That's how you said it, right? Faith. Correct. Uh, um, and what's interesting is I don't think you're in the reject all this is hogwash camp. But I also think you're you're in the camp that Daniel Peterson, and the apologists are actually harming uh, you know, people that otherwise might be willing to give the church, uh, you know, a, a, a look in spite of these problems with the account. So can you first start by saying how are how is Daniel Peterson fair? You know, uh, the Maxwell Institute, whoever the LDS Church essay, how are they harming the situation given that you don't want to run people out of the church instead you want to help those who want to remain constructively engaged find a way to remain engaged. How are they doing harm? How is the church harming? Well, I, it's a good question, and it's an important one. I think that the um, the Korahor narrative comes to mind in the Book of Mormon and Alma 30. Uh, Korahor is portrayed as being the quintessential apostate. And of course, Korahor is like no apostate I know. It's he's he's not logical. He's he does. He's not a good lawyer, Warren. You know, I mean, he's uh, he's he's really not very effective in his argument. But the argument is there because what he does, although he questions whether Christ will come, he questions the things that we may ask questions about. But he goes more than that. He basically gives the same flip side of an all or nothing question. He says you can't know about the future. Well, no, you can't be certain about the future, but you can point to things. And prophecy is certainly, um, if we have faith, we, we think in terms of prophecy as being the possibility. Uh, prophecy doesn't always come to pass. Uh, for example, when, uh, when Jonah you know, prophesied the destruction of Nineveh, it didn't happen. And Jonah was pretty pissed off about it. You know? it so, so the point being is that, that uh, Korahor is portrayed as being... Um, uh, this apostate, but the term used is antichrist. Now, the antichrist term has a specific uh, um, baggage associated with it. I mean, the antichrist in Revelation is is the one who is, uh, you know, destroying the Church of God and everything else like that. So, what I see happening in this in this in this dynamic, particularly around those who volunteer to serve the role of Danites in trying to cleanse the the church of dissenters or people that are doubtful um, is an all or nothing proposition that is equally flawed on either side. And so when, when Gordon B. Hinckley and Bless His Soul is st stating that the first vision requires an all or nothing proposition, the problem is the evidence is that it, is that it isn't all, therefore he, he paints it as being fraud. And that's, that conclusion I think uh, denies the way the spirit works with us. I think um, going a step further, when, um, when, when Dan and his group of apologists published their first version of their interpreter, they, they put out an article calling those of us that are in Mormon stories and elsewhere, Antichrist, that that's the proper name for us. And that type of language makes it so that we can't have an, a narrative. It turns our families against us. It makes it so that we can't have a constructive conversation about these things with anybody because it becomes a polemic, a fighting words narrative between us and them. And that is exactly not what I believe Christ is all about. Christ is about 
coming to one another, to having a dialogue. Christ did not agree with his church leaders, I would note. Christ was somebody who was very much uh, out for the, the, the small person who is, who is doubting. You know, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I mean, it was, it was very much of a, uh, um, how, can I, how can I come to Christ if it's an all or nothing proposition? And this is where, to me, John, the first vision is most important. First of all, um, I'm so thrilled and honored to be on the same panel with, uh, with Sandra. And I mean that absolutely sincerely, because thank God for what she did in the 50s, because in the 60s, because if it weren't for her questions, if it weren't for the fact that somebody gave her a copy of Paul Cheeseman's uh, a master's thesis, this would have never seen the light of day. The 1832 version would still be buried today if it weren't for the work of Sandra Tanner and Gerald Tanner. So thank you very much. We come to different conclusions, yeah. but the, pro the, the idea that the church at the time, when you had questions and really wanted to understand this theology and then to go out after you and, 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 and do the straw man against you, you know, calling you the critic and, and saying that nothing that they would do would ever cause you to believe and everything else like that. That doesn't create dialogue, does it, Sandra? Nope. <laughs> yeah, so to me, so here's where the, the 1832 ver version of the first vision is phenomenally important. When we listen to Richard Rohr, to um, to Rob Bell, or any any of the people that are in the in in this world of really looking at spiritual experience seriously, when we look at William James on the variety of religious experience, the 1832 uh, First Vision account is very much of a personal spiritual experience. It's accessible to anyone. Who seeks it? Not everyone is going to have the same kind of spiritual experience. It's an invitation to come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness of sins. And it's possible that in the various ways that we have spiritual experiences or that we just come to a realization of who we really are, that we can we can have this experience. But one thing about experience, it really can't be described in words. Once we do, we're no longer in the experience. And therefore, I can forgive, in a big way, variations of describing the spiritual experiences. I've had spiritual experiences that I can't describe. I certainly can't place in time or a place, but I do know that a voice told me at one point in time that I needed to go on a mission. A real voice in my mind came there. Now, once I say that, I'm taking myself out of that experience. So I'm I'm generous with the with with the idea that there is a spiritual experience, and while I don't know if Joseph Smith had one or not, I'm willing to grant that it, he did. And the 1832 version sounds very authentic to me. Uh, may not be for everybody, that but it sounds very authentic. Which version? Yep. 32. Go ahead, 32. John. 32, not 38, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. 1832 okay. version sounds very authentic. It sounds very accessible it sounds like something that i may have had and indeed i when i was in the in the depths of my uh, struggles in the past i had such an experience where i believe the savior came to me it not in a you know voice or not in a vision per se but certainly i had this uh this out completely out of uh world experience and understanding that my life could be different and it was that was 30 years ago so i mean to me that's my witness. And the church was not very receptive to that to me. So that's kind of what put me onto this journey. But at the same time, I've realized that the institutional church is not the thing that I rely upon for my spirituality. The first vision, 1832 version, says that I can have an unmediated experience with God. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be sinless. I don't need a priesthood authority to mediate that for me. I don't even need to have the priesthood. Later in life, Joseph Smith would say that without the priesthood, you can't see God. But he did. So the story to me is that the 1832 version is very authentic for what it says to me. And now I move to the 1838 version. And I says it says something else, but it doesn't say it to me. It's a remarkably self-projecting criticism of the church as I see it today. For example, it says that creeds are an abomination. When we look at what Joseph Smith said about creeds three times in his records, he talks about creeds as being 
the things that bind belief to a specific narrative and prevent us from accepting other things that could be revealed. His problem with creeds wasn't what they said, was their very existence in locking down belief. And today we have correlation that locks us down into a certain set of beliefs. He talked about the professors being corrupt. Was it the professors of religion or was it those who profess creeds as being the definitive truth? And do we, get, do we not get corrupted by professing creeds as being the truth when it's just the opinions of men codified by committee? So there's some, there's some criticism to uh, in the 1838 verse vision that's very, very important for us. The last part of that would be the criticism that when we teach for commandments, the doctor, uh, we teach for doctrine, the commandments of men. That's a profoundly troubling statement. It's in the Bible as well. And when we look at it as, as to say, well, when we go to a conference and everything we hear is a commandment, well, whose commandment is it? We're supposed to keep the commandments. Obedience is the first law of heaven, according to many in the church today. Obedience to what? What commandments? Well, whether by my own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. No, it's not the same. It is, it, it is not clearly a commandment of God that blacks could never have a priesthood. It is not clearly a commandment of God that polygamy was a divine principle. It is not clearly a commandment of God that lesbians, gays, transgender, and uh, queers and others can't have a spiritual life in full membership in, the, in God's kingdom. These are commandments of men taught as doctrine. And I think we're very troubled when we get into this path, when we, when we look at their scriptures. I seek a church where we can look at our own behavior and be self-reflective, where we can look at the things that we're doing wrong and we can accept them and apologize for them. And I don't see that today. And the word apology does appear in scripture. It means defense. But the word that we use as apology today in scripture is called repentance. And the entire Bible is about repentance and atonement and reconciliation. So yes, repentance and apology is an essential part of the gospel, not just for the individual, but for the church as well. And as long as apologists continue to push their point to make it so that we who question, we who doubt, we who who criticize because we are trying to understand when we are pushed out of the community, the community is lesser for it. I seek a community where we can be honest with each other. And in that sense of truth, I can have a conversation with Sandra Tanner, and maybe we will disagree with all the outcomes, but I will guarantee that in this session today, we've had an experience where I've learned from somebody who really does have the spirit with her and I hope that, that we've been able to share something that edifies each one of us. And that's the gospel to me. Does that make sense, John? Amen. Preach it, Brother Mark Crego. Can I get an amen from you, Sandra Tanner? Uh, well, to three-fourths of it. <laughs> <laughs> you, got a, you got a 75% amen from Sandra Tanner. That's pretty good. I'll take Mark. it, Sandra. <laughs> well, if the church would just switch to the 1832 account, it would go a long ways to helping them tell an honest history. Amen to that. Well, Mark, your, your words, as were yours, Sandra, uh, Johnny, and... Uh, Warren, all of your words today have been really Absolutely. insightful, really thoughtful. I think we've given the, the first uh, vision, Joseph Smith's first vision, a really good treatment in this uh, almost three hours that we've recorded today. I just really uh, want to thank all of you for being willing to come on. Martine is telling us that it's Chessman, Paul's last name is pronounced Chessman, not Cheeseman. Okay. Thank you. She says... Uh, he was my father-in-law's missionary companion and our mission president in Louisiana. Good to um, know. Thank well, you. Well, he passed away some time ago from what I can tell and uh, rest his soul and hopefully he's not uh, he was a good too writer. with me. Yeah, and we just want to thank all of the people that joined us through Facebook Live. Uh, you, your comments and, and questions enriched our conversation. We want to thank everyone who's joined us 
asynchronously or who will join us through our MP3s, through YouTube, through Facebook video later. Uh, and we want to just take a quick moment to thank uh, everyone who donates to Mormon Stories Podcast or the Open Stories Foundation. We're a transparent 501c3. Uh, we, our mission is to support people in transition, to save marriages, to prevent, uh, you know, depression and anxiety and even sometimes suicidality as a result of the difficulties and challenges of experiencing a faith crisis. If you uh, don't support us, but you enjoy this programming, please go to mormonstories.org and click on the donate button at the top right of the screen. Uh, make a monthly contribution, $10, $20, $50 a month, $100 a month, whatever you can afford. Um, it will go a long way towards keeping this podcast alive, towards uh, supporting the staff. We have the Open Stories Foundation. We have three full-time employees now, myself, Tim Corey, um, Amy Grubbs. Uh, our, our compensation, if you value what we do, depends on your support all the equipment and technology that we use to make all this happen, uh, the internet services, the, the accounting services, the marketing, all that we do. Uh, we rely on your support, so please support us if you, if you can. Um, rem remember our, our workshops and events. We've, had several, um, we've actually had several people recently generously donate to our uh, event scholarship fund, and in that event scholarship fund, um, we have uh, donors who have made it so that if you want to go to a workshop or retreat, but you don't have the funds or the full amount, you can apply for a scholarship by emailing staff at openstoriesfoundation.org and you can apply for a scholarship and we'll make sure you get to those events. So thank you to the donors that, that have uh, donated to the scholarship fund and uh, a note to anyone who wants to attend who can't. There are scholarships available. We want to thank... Uh, Cody Layton, uh, Amy Grubbs, Sharon Price, and everyone who makes all this possible, including the board of directors. And um, we want to just encourage you to please continue supporting us. There are lots of ways to support us. You can like our Facebook page at Mormon Stories Podcast. You can give our Facebook page a positive review. You can follow us on Twitter or on Instagram. You can post these episodes to your social media so that your friends and family, you can forward it or text it privately so that you can share this information. And then, of course, we always really appreciate positive reviews on iTunes. You can go to iTunes, uh, give us a positive review, five stars. Uh, that helps spread the, the word. So uh, thanks to everyone who's participated. Special thanks to Sandra Tanner, Mark Kriego, uh, Johnny, and, um, and Warren for their stuff today. If you want more episodes like this where we cover Mormon history, let us know. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Let us know you like this. Comment on our mormonstories.org uh, page and give us feedback. If you want to be a panelist, if you want to produce or support like Mark Kriego did one of these uh, episodes, email out to us and we'll cover Book of Abraham. We'll cover, uh, you know, polyandry. We'll cover any of the big issues, race or gender. Uh, if you want to cover any of these issues in depth on Mormon Stories, please reach out and we'll make it happen. Any final words, panel? Sounds good. No. Thank you, John. Appreciate being here. Okay. All right. And then you too, Johnny, thanks for joining us. It was great to have you as well. Thanks a lot, John. I really appreciate you uh, making the offer. I, it meant a lot to me. Warren, you're yeah, awesome. Good to, good to get to know you, Johnny. Yeah. yeah, I've enjoyed this a lot. It's fun. All right. Thank you, Warren. Warren, give our best to your family in Dallas. Thank you, Mark. You're amazing. Keep go keep the good work at a thoughtful faith. You're you're helping a lot of people along with Jerry Lee and all those who are doing good work. Yeah. Sandra, it was really good to uh, <laughs> get to see you. Yes, it's good to see all of you. Nice to put faces to people that I see on the internet. <laughs> oh yeah. See you at Sunstone. Okay. All right. And thanks to our listeners. We have uh, Rachel saying thank you. We have Carrie saying love this. Thanks uh, you all for your knowledge and hard work. Um, Karma says, uh, I want to see your words in print, Mark. I agree. Dana says, thank you for the great discussion, John. Mary says, wonderful to hear you all. Lots of love from the listeners. So listeners, lots of love to you back and viewers. We'll see you guys all again soon on Mormon Stories Podcast. 
take care and check in again. And that soon. was the tip of the iceberg. Just yeah. the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> okay. There's a lot more to the first vision. There's a yes. lot more. We just barely scratched the surface. Wow. <laughs>